Sunday Baroque Conversations is made possible by the Friends of Sunday Baroque and is produced at WSHU Public Radio in Fairfield, Connecticut. I'm Suzanne Bona. Thank you for listening. Don't miss an episode of Sunday Baroque Conversations. Subscribe on Apple, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please leave us a review. If you want to find out where you can listen to our weekly show, visit our website, sundaybaroque.org, for a station list and our 24-7 stream. Again, that's sundaybaroque.org. Award-winning musician Jessie Montgomery is a violinist, composer, and teacher. She has earned the Leonard Bernstein Award from the ASCAP Foundation, the Sphinx Medal of Excellence, and Musical America's 2023 Composer of the Year. And since 2021, she's been the Mead Composer-in-Residence with the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. She holds degrees from the Juilliard School and New York University, and she's a composition professor at Bard College, in addition to her busy schedule as a performer in her own ensembles, as well as with the Silk Road Ensemble and Sphinx Virtuosi. Jessie Montgomery joins me on Zoom to talk about her life in music. Welcome. Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks for having me. Such an honor to meet you. Um, So you grew up in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. You had a really richly creative environment, Um, theater artist, storyteller mom, and a musician dad. What was your early introduction into making music, um, and how did your parents' creative lives influence you in those early days? Yeah, sure. So I grew up, uh, you know, as you mentioned, among uh, art, a community of artists. Um, so like the, the notion of living one's life as an artist was just, um, kind of part of my daily experience. Um, and so, um, and my mom was a very active, um, performer, um, director, playwright. Um, and so we would often go on tour. My dad would write the music sometimes for some of her plays. He was the, would be the music director. So, I would spend some time with them um, in the summers when I wasn't in school. Um, I would go on tour with them. Um, so I lived, you know, I spent a lot of time in backstages um, of theaters and sort of hanging out with musicians and actors and, um, and you know, often them, oftentimes them sometimes taking care of me. Um, <laughs> my parents were busy. Um, my mom tells this funny story about me Um backstage with Samuel L. Jackson. This is before he was a big star. My mom uh, worked with so many different people in the, her early days. And um, she has this funny story of me folding programs with Samuel L. Jackson before wow. one of her plays <laughs> backstage. Just these sort of um, occurrences. So um, so it was rich with, you know, with artistic input. Um, and so when I decided, so to speak, to become a musician as my um, way of life, it was a very natural decision and a very, um, luckily they had set up all the right things and had, I had, my mom was able to sniff out good teachers, you know, that's a skill all on, on its own and right. sort of like knowing because her being a teacher herself, she sort of could tell which way to point me in. So um, luckily I had very good guidance in that, in that respect. Mm. Um, And yeah. And so it was, you know, like many people who decide to go into um, like a traditional Western classical training, um, you decide that around high school. So it was really around high school that I just decided I would pursue music. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. Um, Yeah. Did you think you would be a full-time violin player or like, how did that look in your mind at that point? You know, at the time I didn't really have, I hadn't been composing like seriously. I had been composing more for my own just development and enjoyment. Um, And I had said, I think when I set out to, in my career, I thought I was gonna be like primarily a performer for Mm -hmm. sure. I thought I would be a violinist that played with um, different ensembles or things like that. I I knew only one thing for certain was that I didn't want to be an orchestra musician. Mm. Um, mainly because I felt I was not going to be the right personality for an orchestra. I would be frustrated by not having my own autonomy, I think. So, Mm -hmm. um, I just sort of took the risk and didn't go down that path. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And the irony has been, of course, that I've become so um, intertwined with orchestras and <laughs> and through the orchestral network, um, through my compositions, which has been a real a real gift. It's really, right. um, and I have a tremendous respect for for orchestra musicians and 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 that path because um, it's not an easy one um, mm -hmm. for certain. Um, and and the amount you know the 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 pressure immense pressure that they're on to 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 um, pull these performances together, right. um, and so it's really a real gift to work with an orchestra that is committed to also to new to just as much to uh, their Beethoven performances as they are to the new music performances, right. and that's always um, a really gratifying experience. Yeah, what how does that look like when you're brought in to work with an orchestra on a, a piece, mm -hmm. whether it's a commission or whether you know whether they're just they're including a piece of yours on the program? Like how does that work? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of planning that goes involved. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, with the commissioning and uh, which conductor is going to conduct. Is it going to be their regular music director or is it going to be their guest conductor for the season? Or um, And so, you know, once that's all sorted out, um, I go down and, you know, if best case scenario, I'll have a meeting with the conductor to go over the music um, and, you know, and then just start putting it together, you know, have to fit, fit the rehearsals in on their, uh, you know, their very strict rehearsal schedules. So, um, you know, it has to be pretty tight the piece has to be, <clears throat> has to be really kind of there, um, which is, that's, the, I would say the biggest challenge of working with an orchestra is there isn't a lot of room for, um, any, you know, a lot of changes on the spot and things like that. Right. Um, so you have to be really well prepared and also willing to let things, let a few things kind of go in, in a direction that was maybe unplanned. Um, so that's, uh, you know, and so like learning to be flexible and also, um, and also really direct about your ideas is really important when we're working with the orchestra because you're working against the clock right. all the time. So, um, but, uh, but it can be very rewarding experience when all the right, you know, when all the, all the pieces are in the right place. Um, it's massively rewarding to hear an orchestra play, you know, debut a new work. Wow, yeah. yeah. So um, we're, we're, we've sort of zoomed ahead to Jesse Montgomery, the very famous in-demand uh, composer. But I'd like to go back again to, to talk about some early things. Would you uh -huh. talk about any of the mentors and teachers that you've had that really impacted the musician you have become, the person that you have become? Absolutely. Um, so I always tell the story of my very first violin teacher. Her name is Alice Kanak, um, who um, has her own school now in Rochester, New York. She was, uh, luckily for me, teaching in New York um, in the early 80s. And I, um, she was developing a method of um, teaching that bridged the Suzuki, what's the very traditional and well-known method, the Suzuki method, training method, with her own interpretation of Suzuki in a way to teach improvisation to young kids. So along the rigid, you know, the path of like rigid and formal mm -hmm. kind of rote training of Suzuki, I was also learning this to be creatively expressive with my music. She valued that that having those two things happen in parallel was really essential to the developing young brain. Um, and so she's become like a kind of guru in um, early childhood, um, create music, creative, creative development. Wow. Um, and then of course, later when I, when I, um, had my teachers, Ann Setzer and Sally Thomas, um, at the Juilliard school, um, I would say that was my real like education in terms of learning how to be a really, really, really solid violinist, right. And really can be, could be competitive with my peers and, um, and really express the full, you know, value of, of the instrument and of, um, and the, and the, and the technique and really get, um, yeah, really, um, kind of square up in a lot of ways, you know, I had such a really <clears throat> beautifully free, um, expression in my, in my music. And then there's <clears throat> inevitably comes a point for a musician when you have to sort of tie things up and, and get the technique really sound so that you can, like I said, be competitive and or um, play at a, a, an extremely high level. So I was love, luckily, luckily able to, um, you know, um, work with them and 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 through, throughout my undergraduate degree. Um, and that led to very many opportunities to play with musicians 
um, of an extremely high caliber and to create projects um, and, and embark on this performing career that really sustained me um, in the very first beginning parts of my career. Yeah. So at what point did you then, did your composing become not just for yourself, but it did become this, this form of expression that you share with the rest of us. Yeah. So, you know, really at a, at some point, all of those things kind of combined my interest in composition and improvisation and, um, and performance. Um, I, my, I, I let my friends know that on the side I was writing. And so I, thanks to a few very caring friends, they encouraged me to continue to write and that they would agree to perform my music. Um, and so, um, through, through that process, I, um, started to write more pieces and then um, got my first commissions in about 2008 that started coming in. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, slowly but surely other colleagues started to um, um, hear about some of these pieces and wanted to program them themselves. Mm -hmm. And on and on, they began to perform and tour these pieces. And then the, the music began to slowly circulate. Great. Um, yeah. Great. So uh, once again, I want to uh, double back to your parents and the wonderful example mm -hmm. and upbringing they gave you, because it was not only one of folding programs with Samuel L. Jackson and going on the road <laughs> right. and being backstage, which is really fun and exciting. And, and you know, it's sort of its own special mm -hmm. kind of experience. But they also took you to rallies and performances and parties with activists and artists. And you really got to be steeped in some very important movements of the time, even as a, a young mm -hmm. person, as a child. And you've, mm -hmm. I think, crafted a life that merges your composing, your performance with education and advocacy as well. And I, I have to assume, but I don't want to assume, was that an outgrowth of, of that upbringing? Or, or, you know, was that, were you just drawn to that sort of independently yeah no it's certainly um certainly you know the idea of an artist being an active and necessary member of their community and one that has a very strong voice in mm -hmm. the direction that a community will take that's been something that yeah was just exampled for me um so much as a, as a kid um and it's something that um i you know, I've carried with me and am always looking for ways to um, apply myself or center myself in a way that will, you know, allow a message to come through or allow a door to be open for another young person to walk through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's about finding opportunities and pathways for young, particularly young people, because when you while you're growing and developing and becoming a citizen, you know, it's important to, you know, understand what's really valuable and in, in for us as people and mm -hmm. how you can contribute. I mean, a, a life of being an artist is being a life is living a life of service. Um, and that's that's how I see it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, as I go along, even now, I'm, you know, got wheels turning on projects um, that I won't go into detail right now because it's really just germing, germinating in there. But mm -hmm. um you know, ideas for for projects that are more sort of civil, civil, you know, based in, in communities and based in um, community development. Yeah. Um, well, this yeah. is um, a perfect jumping off point to ask about your 2014 composition banner. Um, that was the marking the tw 200th anniversary of the Star Spangled Banner for the Sphinx Organization and the Joyce Foundation. Could you talk a little bit about that piece and, and that commission and how it came about? Sure. Um, so that that commission came in 2014, right, which was to commemorate the 200th anniversary of the Star Spangled Banner. Um, and I, um, at the time, it was one of my earliest commissions. Um, and I, um, it, it came, yeah, through the Sphinx organization, which I've been affiliated with for a very long time. Um, and it was their first um commission for me for their main main program of the Sphinx Virtuosi. Um, and yeah, and that that piece opened up an interesting dialogue for me as an artist and also just, you know, it, it gave me a way to share a point of view, which is, you know, that this the way that we celebrate and the way that we celebrate, especially through song, um, has so much messaging in it. Um, and some for some people, the Star Spangled Banner has a has a you know for most Americans you know you know has a feeling of celebration and 
um, triumph and freedom. And yet, you know, for so many Black Americans and the people that I come from, you know, it's had it doesn't leave room for Black voices and Black experiences. Um, and, you know, the, um, you know, there's always been so controversy around that, around that song for Black people. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, celebrating the song to me meant opening up the song into like what it, what it really means. It means if it means celebrating America and everything that, you know, happens in this land, it's totally contra it's totally full of conflict actually mm -hmm. in the end. Um, and also, you know, I wanted to invite other perspectives into the song and into the meaning of the song. So it includes um, kind of in, in the spirit of Charles Ives um, colliding songs um, and patriotic songs from surrounding regions uh, around the United States with, with whom we've had ongoing conflict. Um, and so that song sort of is this stew pot of all of these songs and um, that sort of collide into each other and yet create still a celebratory effect um, and a, um, a kind of really energetic kind of feeling to it. So that's sort of how I approached, you know, writing a song that was to celebrate the accomplishments or the, you know, milestones of this country, uh, yeah. essentially, you know, so. You um you referenced your long affiliation with the Sphinx organization. Um, I think you're composer in residence for Sphinx Virtuosi, two time laureate of the annual Sphinx competition, and the recipient of the Sphinx Medal of Excellence. Mm -hmm. um, would you talk about the Sphinx organization and what it has meant to your life and career? Um, yes, of course. Um, so in to oh my gosh. When I was graduating high school, I auditioned for Sphinx for the first time, and I became um, part of their network, amazing network of musicians. Um, I did. I participated in their competition many times. I taught at their summer festivals. I've spoken on panels at their um, annual conferences, and I've received many honors through the Sphinx organization. Um, so, and some of my, like I mentioned earlier, commissions. Um, so, I have you know, a, a tremendous, tremendous, um, you know, relationship and respect and admiration, of, you know, sort of this wonderful relationship with Sphinx that's developed over the years um, and continue collaboration. You know, the, the wonderful thing is that, you know, once you become part of Sphinx, there's a, say, a saying that you become part of La Familia. <laughs> and so luckily, you know, many opportunities and friendships and collaborations have come through my um, affiliation with Sphinx. Hmm. Um, and again, and they continue, you know, I point my students in their direction. I can, you know, there continues to be opportunities for uh, future generations through their work. And so just, it's a real uh, honor to be, you know, and real gift to be a part of something that has created so much change really um, yeah. in our, in our cl classical music community, especially, but also for concert goers in general. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So speaking of La Familia, yeah. one of your many projects has a very personal angle to it. It's the Nonette inspired by the Great Migration, told from the perspective of your great-grandfather, William McCauley. Um, I'd love for you to talk about that, and particularly how did that project evolve? Sure. Yeah, that 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 came together um, through a grant by the Chamber of Music by Chamber of Music America mm -hmm. um, that was um, initiated by the Imani Winds, mm -hmm. and so we did a collaboration with the Imani Winds and my then the string quartet, the Catalyst Quartet, um, and I wanted to write a suite um, based on some some research that I was doing on my great great grandfather who was a Buffalo soldier, um, and. So the song is a kind of an interpret an interpretation of his migration story um, from Norfolk, Virginia, through the West um, up to the north um, northwest, Midwest, and then uh, and then eventually back down to Washington D.C. Um, <clears throat> and 
So the story sort of takes you through a few uh, hymns and folk songs and um, that 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 come from different regions that he that he might have traveled through during his migration story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so before we started uh, talking today, Julie said, you have to ask her about Big Dog, Little Dog. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sure. Um, so let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Tell me about your partner in Big Dog, Little Dog. Who's sure. the big dog? Is she the big dog? Because she's got the big instrument? Yes, okay. she's the big dog, yeah. <laughs> so I have this project, yeah, called Big Dog, Little Dog, um, which is with my very good friend and colleague, Eleanor Oppenheim. She plays the bass. Um, she's the big dog. Uh, <laughs> and on the base and uh we've known each other since college and i've always wanted to collaborate and finally about five years ago we said let's just do it and we started writing pieces together um mm -hmm. and <clears throat> it's a wonderful outlet for me you know so much of what i'm writing uh so much of my work as a composer involves being by myself in a room you know coming up with my own pieces and then you know it's a long process to get from the thought of creating the piece to the piece actually being performed. Whereas with Eleanor, we just pull out our instruments and we start writing and there it is. And we just, we record it. We say, okay, that'll go on the album. That won't go on the album. This will play on shows. This will, you know, keep in our back pocket for later. We have all this material mm. uh, constantly flowing between us. And it's just, um, it's a wonderful outlet for just more spontaneous creativity and, um, and collaboration. And it's just a really fun project. That's one of one of my playing projects. And then another project that's in development called the Everything Band, which is also oh. likewise um, uh, a group. On, it's a group ensemble. <clears throat> it's a group, uh, rather, I should say it's an ensemble about uh, that fluctuates between about seven or eight people at any time and is made up of mostly composer arrangers. So folks who also um you know have a have a, a desire to or experience in um composing or arranging so that that therefore when we get into a space together it's just fun <laughs> if you could imagine a bunch of composer performers yeah. um getting together to write music it's just um i you know it, it's become a really fun fun thing to look forward to um, so we're looking forward to some performances in the, in the 24, 25 season that are coming up. <clears throat> Very cool. So let, let us talk about the composing process. Cause I think, you know, especially for people who are not musicians, you know, I think it's, it can be kind of mysterious. You have written many different kinds of, of compositions and solo works and chamber music and vocal music and orchestral music. So, you know, how do you decide what to compose? How do you decide what the instrument instrumentation will be? Do you are you like the writer that like says, okay, this is my composing time, and every day you sit down and you've got your blank sheet of paper and you don't leave the room until you've written a certain number of notes? Or like, how does that how does that work? What is your discipline? What is your process for composing? Yeah, well, you know, um, I think probably the most consistent thing about my closing process is how inconsistent it is <laughs> <laughs> I like that <laughs> um as you can imagine I you know I wear a lot of hats I have you know a, a, along with you know the um creative needs for any project there are a slew of administrative needs that go on on top of that um I also do some teaching so I balance my schedule between all of those things mm -hmm. and um you know I try to spend if I spend a good two to three hours on music a day that includes practicing my violin. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I kind of put them all, I lump them all together as one, as my music time, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> um, if I get two to three hours of that solid un, uninterrupted a day, that's, that's a gift, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah. And I try to do all my writing in the morning before the day gets too, too hectic or too busy. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, I, it's depending on what the project is, I will do a lot of some, some projects, I'll do a lot of research and collecting sort of ideas about what I want to write ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Um, and some pieces just come flow more naturally. A lot of the pieces that are like string pieces or pieces that are like closer to, or solo violin works, um, mm -hmm. things like that kind of come a little more quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, and so each piece really has its, its own kind of different process depending on that size and scope um mm -hmm. instrumentation things like that so it's mm -hmm. a little hard to kind of pinpoint exactly 
you know, there's, there's many modes. What do, what do they say? There's no wrong way to skin a cat, right? <laughs> right. It's a terrible expression, but it's kind of how it goes uh, for me. Right. Um, other composers, I think, are a little bit more rigid. I have other friends who are, um, I don't see them from, you know, 9 a.m., Oh. to 9 p.m. because they're in their studio all day you know right so I'm not that person I'm, I'm a little bit more bit, I bip and bop around a little bit more but uh-huh. Uh-huh. um but yeah a good two to three hours of of just of notation work a day of some kind is um, usually gets me through yeah yeah so you mentioned your students, um, and you've had some really lovely and, and and important experiences with some important teachers and mentors. How do those mm-hmm. experiences inform the teacher that you have become? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's you know I um, I tr- I try to you know, I try to think of myself, it's different with a violin student versus a composing student, right? Very, they're very different because violin is, um, it's a a practice that's based in like physics, you know, (laughs) it's the physics of playing an instrument and understanding how the instrument works and how you can best produce, you know, the best result of the best sound, the most honest rendition of a, of a word that's already been conceived. Um, and then you're bringing your interpretation to it, your tone, your, um, you know, things that are very like practical. Right. So teaching a violin lesson is much more, um, there's a method, much more of a method to it. Mm-hmm. Whereas composing is very much like the method kind of comes out of conversation, out of getting to know the student mm-hmm. over time throughout the semester and then, you know, coming up with an individualized project that fits that particular student, you know, by the end. And it was very, it's a much more, I would say, individualized um, practice. Although with violin students, of course, you have to take that into account as well. But in terms of like what we do from week to week, it's very, again, like like my composing practice, it's like um, you have to go with what's there at that day. Um, and there's... Um, yeah, you're finding, you're helping a student find their creativity. Um, and so I think of myself as like a, you're guiding as a really a guide towards a, their own thoughts, you know, h- helping them understand how they think about music. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yes. Tour guide. <laughs> so <laughs> what else are you passionate about right now, musical or otherwise? Do you have time for non-musical things? What, what do you love to do? Yeah. You know what? I just signed up for a pottery class that I'm really excited about. <laughs> oh, Julie's excited like because she's also hands. doing pottery. Yeah, they're very therapeutic. Yeah. No way. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah, I like doing things with my hands, drawing, pottery, anything. And, you know, it sort of exploits still the hand-eye coordination that's required for being a musician. Sure. <laughs> I think that's part might be part of it. Yeah. Um, and I love cooking, too. I love... Um, mm. And I and I don't want to give too much away, but I am doing on um, the Chicago World Fair of 1893. So that's been really fun, learning all the things that I can learn about that. I just mm-hmm. went down to the Jack to Jackson Park the other day. I st- I'm going to do multi. I have like a whole plan, do multiple trips down there to sort of explore and walk around and kind of fantasize a little about about the time and the, about the what that time was really like um and oh. so just learning learning about about that particular event that particular time in our history has been really exciting i have a few um i'll be doing some uh rotating through a few of the chicago libraries uh to do some more research on that so yeah very cool I have been speaking on Zoom with the supremely versatile and multi-talented award-winning violinist, composer, and educator, Jesse Montgomery. I cannot thank you enough for making time to speak with me. It's been delightful. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.